yesterday I'd, I'd got through uh, actually not that much of the things I, I was intended to talk about, but I thought it was quite, uh, we talked about fast categorization, recognition, and plasticity in visual, visual processing, processing, how we learn, you know, things like uh, the Dalmatian pattern. And we are talking about auditory recognition. Um, today what I'd like to do is talk about uh, uh, sort of comparing uh, our brains with, with computers, essentially, trying to compare, you know, how far we got in trying to reproduce human levels of performance. Uh, and uh, what... What we'll see is actually that uh, in, in computer vision, we've actually, uh, we, um, uh, there's been an awful lot of progress in the last few years, and we have, we have actually quite uh, uh, realistic systems that can uh, re essentially reproduce human levels of performance, but the way they work, the way they learn is, is so totally unlike uh, biology. I think that's where we have to really work, and that's what the relevant thing here is. Um, we need learning rules which uh, make sense from a biological point of view. So the, 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 I'm going to be arguing that what's missing from these you know, computational vision approaches is that uh, uh, the, the way they learn is, uh, is, is incorrect uh, from a biological point of view. So um, you know, we, we, we've already seen the, the, these sort of things, and I'm sure you all remember what this is, right? Yes? Do you? <laughs> A couple of dan dances, and then we had sounds, but I think, I'd, yeah, the sound's not connected, so anyway, you, you, you know the sort of thing. So th these are, these are, th this is what we're trying to understand, how, we, how the brain can recognise stimuli, how we can learn to, re to, uh, to do this, and, and also how we can do it so quickly, because uh, uh, that's another challenge to models, of, uh, it's to understand how we do that. And, uh, and, and then there's this particular problem of how, oh, thanks, of how we can, I don't think I actually got any, I haven't got any more sounds anyway, so I don't think. Uh, uh, how can we still get, keep those memories intact over long periods? So, um, you know, if we compare the sort of uh, uh, the brain with its, uh, uh, you know, this is a simulation of 16 million neurons, but there are actually 16 billion in the cortex. So imagine this with a thousand times more little flashing dots, and you've got something fairly fairly accurate. There are, so we now know there's 16 billion neurons in the cortex, maybe 4 billion in the visual system in the human. Um, the, the firing rates uh, are limited. You couldn't possibly get more than, you know, spikes clo closer against... The, so I say at one kilohertz, but realistically, neurons, it's more like a few hundred spikes per second, absolutely top. Uh, one thing which I think is very important is that uh, the conduction velocities of intracortical fibres are actually quite slow, sort of one to two metres per second. So a lot of the time that uh, we take in making the decision is actually conduction delays rather than computation. But of course the great thing is that uh, our, our brains are very, very power efficient. It, it all runs on 20 watts, which is actually uh, pretty phenomenal. Now we can compare that with you know, state-of-the-art computer thing. If you go out and buy the latest graphics boards, uh, an NVIDIA GTX Titan X, it, you get 11 teraflops, which are, you know, a teraflop is a million million floating point no calculation every second. It's got thousands of cores, billions of transistors, it's got a you know, 480 gigabit memory bus. Uh, it gets quite hot, um, uh, but you know these are actually getting really quite cheap. And if you want to build a, a supercomputer, you just you know buy a box. You can put four of these in one box. This is phenomenal processing power, and you can sort of ask the question: Well, is that enough to produce, reproduce human levels of performance? Well, I have to be honest. Until um, until very recently, I'd have said no way. The human vision is is way better than anything that anybody can do. But um, the, the, the critical thing, of course, is, is uh, understanding what the, 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 the underlying architecture is, because uh, if you don't know how, how to do the, the, the computation, then, uh, uh, then you don't know how to put it on a machine. And I think that there has been a real, real shift, and it, it goes, you can trace it back to the sort of, uh, 1980s when Jerry Feldman, who's a computer scientist, uh, proposed the 100-step limit. Uh, he, he said, you know, he, you know, this is pure you know, uh, guesswork on his part. He says he thinks about half a second to recognise an object, you know. Uh, he said uh, spike, in intervals between spikes about five milliseconds, and therefore you can't have more than about 100 massively parallel steps between the image coming on and you deciding who it is, for instance. 
And this was actually, this 100-step limit was one of the things that pushed uh, the development of PDP and connectionist models back in the middle of the, uh, the 1980s. At the time, those models were very limited by the hardware, but in fact, most of the, uh, the ideas for, that we now find in, in deep learning and convolutional neural networks were actually already there. It's just the computers were so slow that you could only do a few hundred units. Um, but anyway, I, when I read um, Jerry Feldman, um, you know, I, I thought we could surely do a little bit more better, better than this. And having just you know, recently been in Edmund's lab, where uh, this, this is Dave Perrett and, and Woody Kahn with Edmund's recording of a, of a neuron in the uh, infratemporal cortex responding at 100 milliseconds. So we knew that the brain has the answer to the question, is there an, a face in the picture in 100 milliseconds? It's not half a second, it's 100 milliseconds. And uh, this is another uh, neuron from Edmund's lab. This is uh, in the lateral hypothalamus, which has got nothing to do with vision at all. And it's visual responses to food. And it's kicking in at 150 milliseconds. So vision has been done, essentially, uh, by then in the monkey brain. And so you know, I, I, I just said, to her, well, these neurons are at least actually 10 synapses. I mean, if you talk about processing layers, yes, it's four. But since the neurons in V1 that receive from the natural geniculate are not actually those that project onto the next state, you know, it's more like 10 processing layers. And I just sort of basically back of the envelope calculation and said, well, if you've got 10 layers, you've got 10 milliseconds per layer, because th these neurons fire at actually before 100 milliseconds, uh, but this is uh, as an illustration. And if the firing rates of the neurons don't manage to get over about 100 spikes per second, you essentially, you're kind of having to do this pretty much on a feed-forward pass, and maybe you only get one spike per neuron uh, in the vast majority of cases. You know, a really, really firing, uh, a reactive neuron might manage to get two spikes in 10 milliseconds. But, um, and so, you know, I actually, in, this, in, the, in this, this review paper, I made a whole number of outrageous claims, as, as I tend to do, like uh, the, the visual system you know, uh, is essentially got 10 processing layers. You have to be, get things done in a single feedforward pass. You maybe only get one spike per neuron, making rate coding ab uh, above, you know, just simply yes or no, did the neuron fine, actually quite difficult. And certainly iterative loops, which many people assumed were necessary, I, I couldn't see how to do it, because if you have the neuron fires a spike, sends its uh, information to the next cortical layer, then you have to come back and use the neuron again. That sort of iterative processing is really, really time consuming, and you really want to avoid it if possible. Back in 1989, this was very much thought as you know, uh, incompatible with the anatomy. I mean, actually, it's interesting, Edmund, was, you were talking about the feedback pathways as being how the hippocampus can let, uh, get the information back in. But for the straight object recognition, uh, I think we'd probably all agree that it's the feed forward pass that does the, all the work. So um, this is the sort of figure that you get with images, this is a monkey brain with rough approximate latencies, and you're going through all, the, all this hardware, and this is where you get the face selective cells and so on. And uh, the point I was making is basically sort of, uh, Edmund, Edmund was talking about these sort of latency differences as well. It's about 10 milliseconds per stage, if you like. But a lot of that timing is going to be conduction delays, because that distance here of, shall we say, 30 to 40 millimeters in a monkey brain at one meter per second, you've, you've used up 30 to 40 milliseconds just to getting from A to B. And so the, the time you've got for computing is so short that, well, apart from being a feed forward, basically a few milliseconds per processing step, one spike per neuron probably, very sparse, sparse coding, because actually the, you know, it's not true that every neuron in V1 all starts firing at the same time. They are actually, there's a lot of um, differences between different neurons. And, well, we knew that from the, the flashing images and getting people to say, is there an, an animal present, that you, even with no context, this sort of system actually works pretty well. So how does the state of art computer vision compare with that? And as I say, until a few years ago, I thought, no way, we, you know, we don't know how to do this. But then uh, there's a thing called the ImageNet Challenge, which is what all computer vision people are sort of trying hard to uh, be the best at. They give you 10 million training images 
uh, with about 10,000 different labels, so each image has a label, and, you, uh, and your task is, you're given a, the training set, you train up your system, and then during the competition phase, they give a whole no load of new images, and your system has to come up with the right labels. Uh, and in, specifically, they have a thousand different labels. And I was at the European Conference on Computer Vision with Yann Lacan, actually, uh, in, in 12, uh, 2012. The whole place was buzzing with the fact that the state of the art in computer vision had been uh, wiped off the map by the most stupid feed-forward convolutional neural network imaginable. It's just a, a feed-forward convolutional neural net trained with backpropagation, which is this learning rule which uh, you know, I don't believe happens in the... I think only Jeff Hinton might think possibly that it would work in the brain. But um, uh, anyway, so this is uh, uh, Jeff Hinton and his two students at the University of Toronto. Uh, and the, here's the architecture. Image comes in, it's got seven layers. Uh, it's got a bunch of convolutional neural layers, a couple of fully connected layers, and then it's got the, the thousand output units grandmother cells, I would call them. Um, uh, and they show you exactly how it's wired up. Uh, it's got these different layers, and, uh, and you've got different numbers of neurons in each layer. Uh, so the first layer, which is a sort of bit like V1, has 96 different filters uh, which are trained, uh, and each filter looks at an 11 by 11 patch of pixels in the image, and you do the, exactly the same thing everywhere. Uh, so that's why it's called a convolutional neural network. But then you do this uh, several uh, times. And they actually, in, the, in this paper, they give you the filters that were used in the, in the 90s. Here they are, the 96 filters uh, in, in the layer one. And you know, anybody who's looked at neurons in V1 uh, uh, say, well, these look remarkably like uh, neurons in V1. And, and they, they do. You know, you, they're sort of Gabor patches at different orientations, spatial frequencies. You've got color as well. They don't give you uh, the stuff here, but that's because it's actually quite difficult to just draw the receptive fields. But you can look at these things, and people are now comparing the, the units here with neurons, and, and, and it turns out that, you know, that V4 has properties that resemble this. It's quite difficult to point exactly what they're doing. But anyway, this system, 650,000 neurons, which is actually quite small relative to our own visual systems, it's got 60 million parameters to tune, and this is, this is the real killer problem. Uh, but it's actually 630 million synapses, uh, but a lot of them are, are doing the same, same weights. Now, the, 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 what happened was that um, because uh, Alex Krasinski is a super GPU geek, he managed to write the code so fast that it, essentially it would process an image in, in a millisecond. Or in fact, uh, it will, uh, he loads up 100 images and in 100 milliseconds he's got all the answers. He was able to run training cycles uh, in his bedroom, I understand. He had two graphics boards and, and he used the, the, uh, the 10 million images and just ran the, you know, hundreds of billions of trading cycles in six weeks. And that's how he just wrote, wrote, wrote off the competition. And so every image was sort of zoomed and, uh, and rotated and flipped and adding noise and things like this. So he just used loads and loads of training data and you can get the thing to work. And w when I asked uh, Alex to send me some illustrating, illustrative images, th he just said this is a set of 18 randomly chosen animal pictures out of the, the testing, testing set. set. And, and for each, each one, one you've got, got the ground truth, which is what the, you're trying to get as an answer. And here you've got the output levels of uh, the, top, the, the five most active labels in the output layer. Now, I've actually ranked these in order of performance in a sense. The, the top row is all incredibly good. So sea slug, uh, the length of this pink bar is you know, actually the activation level in the, in the label. And, but its next best, best choices are flatworm, coral reef, sea cucumber, coral. Uh, all of these things, you know, these are all mammals, these are all things under the sea, these are all fish, these are all dogs. It's doing really very well. Um, it's like getting a little bit less good. You're getting more, more activity in the other alternatives here. This mite is you've got a weak signal, if you like, but you know, it's not even properly within the image. This is, this, I love this one. Uh, this is a spider monkey, and it got it wrong because the first choice was howler monkey, but it got spider, spider monkey in second. And compare this. But would anybody like to tell me which of these? This is a howler monkey. This is a spider monkey. I mean, it, it's a very, very difficult task. 
This, this it was a night snake, it said hogno snake. This is a, this is a rough grout, it said partridge. Uh, the chimpanzee in third position, actually, he thought it was a gorilla, had no, uh, got this completely wrong. None of the five top labels was a Gordon setter, but the head isn't even visible. <laughs> and, and my preferred one, this is, this, this is wonderful, the correct response is a cherry, and the system said it was a Dalmatian and got it wrong. Well, um, <laughs> it also said grape, elderberry, and currant. And I have to be honest, I, I, when, I, when I, he sent me this, I just said, wow. That is absolutely astonishing. I can basically retire because vision has been solved, sort of. Uh, 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 the, you know, and, and this is basically, you know, for those who don't know, Jeff Hinton and his two students set up a company called DNN Research, which was bought by Google for $600 million. And Yann Lecun, who was the other guy who'd been around since the, uh, the 80s doing backprop and all the rest of it, hired by, by Facebook, and this has just taken over everything. And now we've got these deep learning uh, systems that are replacing all sorts of jobs and, uh, and positions. You know, I mean, uh, you name it. If you, can, if you can get training data, you can replace you know, experienced radiologists looking at you know, mammograms and deciding whether it's breast cancer or not. Just get the training data. You train up your system, and it works. Now, that's... Um, that's pretty amazing, and, it, and it's, this, is, this is what's happening in the last few years, and it's really taken over. Now, uh, you know, supervision like this, and I said, uh, uh, this is the primate, this is Jim DiCarlo's map, and I sort of said to Alex Krzyzewski, oh, you, you, you did exactly the same question as, as, as Edmund was asking, yeah, you know, why did you use 100? Well, it, just, it works, you know, so this works. It wasn't, they weren't copying the, the, the primate visual system, but it did work, and... Uh, and it's, this, you know, it's essentially convergent evolution. These guys don't really care very much about trying to you know, produce exactly equivalent systems. So, you know, uh, you might think, well, you know, maybe humans are still better. And actually, I recommend reading this guy's blog. Um, he set up a, a, a website where you can, you can go through the entire ImageNet data, uh, training set uh, 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 if you want. Uh, and so you actually have, if you scroll through this, you've got the 1,000 different uh, class uh, classes and you've got uh, 13 different examples from each. And it gives you a, 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 a new image and you have to try and work out which you think it is. And you're allowed to look at all the different things. And this is me thinking it was probably a Gordon setter, but I'm not really sure. And then you... Um, whoops. And then you click on the button, and this is the correct answer, Tibetan Mastiff, and this is the Google Net predictions, and, and it gets it right. So this guy... Uh, um, ah, sorry. Um, you know, this is back in 2015, I think. No, 2014. He was very proud of the fact it was really worth doing, because he trained himself for months trying to get up to the levels of... Of, of the, the image net thing. And you know, I managed to get uh, my, uh, my own error down to 5.1%. I was beating the 6.8% the, the uh, uh, with the other system. Well, unfortunately, the year after that, you got uh, guys from Microsoft getting with the same database base, uh, down to 4.9%. Basically, I think we've, we've, we've been written out of a job. And it's the same thing for... Um, you know, face recognition, this is a, you know, another convolutional neural network for identifying faces. And again, it will beat humans. Um, you just give it enough training. So the surprises that this thing works at all, there are a huge number of surprises. I mean, because you're getting human levels of performance despite, despite the fact that there's no feedback at all. I mean, it's just pure feed-forward paths. There are no horizontal connections. I mean, I, you'd imagine you'd, having connections between neurons in, the, in V1 or something to do linking might be useful. No, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be necessary. There's no top-down control. You don't have to tell the system what to look for. No need for context. You'll do, it do, it does the processing in a millisecond, as I said. Uh, there are no dendrites. There are no complex channel dynamics. There are, there are only positive and negative weights. There's no dynamics. It's just uh, you know, each layer calculates on the basis of the previous layer in one shot. There's no memory in the sense that uh, you, know, you don't have to use the previous trial. To, you know, every image is processed uh, from scratch. There are no oscillations. There's no binding. 
N nothing, you know, nothing for Anne Treesman uh, to, to use. I mean, it, uh, and there's no attention, and there's no spikes, which is a bad thing for me. I say, yes, Edmund. Can I just point out one little thing? You say there's no top-down control. Of course, it's a totally supervised <laughs> training. Oh, ah, uh, yes, yes. Totally different to our brains, oh. in that you have we'll to tell the output what it's got to respond to. You decide. Yeah. And, Tell them you're and it has and feedback it has to learn in it. the learning because it, yes. it, it, it's had a, a, a hundred million or a hundred billion training cycles with feedback to get the weight set up. But once it's set up, yes. it, it, it will run on its own on your iPhone. But basically. the crucial distinction is it's a totally supervised system. Absolutely. Whereas as far as we know, the brain is unsupervised. Exactly. And that's precisely my point. So, um, yeah, sorry. And also I would challenge the no attention. Maybe it has all the attention, like 100% attention for each job. <laughs> if you like, I mean, but if, if, I mean, you, you saw the architecture. It really is that stupid. There is no, there is nobody going in and saying, "I'm going to look at this bit of the image." It doesn't have any time to do it. It has to process the entire image in parallel, with no possibility of saying, "Oh, the interesting bits over here." It comes out with the answer in one shot. So I don't know where do you, where's the room for retention in there? I, I don't see it. You can attend to, to the whole thing at once. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's not yes, but I mean, you know, it's a it's a a really really stupid feed forward convolutional neural network. Co talking about attention because it processes the entire image seems to me, you know, a bit of a distraction. It's not attention like we normally think of it. So anyway, why do you say the brain is unsupervised? Because we go to school and we are taught that this is the shared paradigm is based on this stuff. Okay. Can I just say this is a really crucial point, so I'll make it really clear. If you have a bunch of neurons at the end of your system in infrarotemporal, and okay. someone comes in as a teacher and says, this neuron has to respond to cats, this one to dogs, and this one to Simon, and then I have to learn all the mappings from the inputs up to there that will produce just that, that's a supervised system. A magical person says, this neuron has to do something. There's nothing in our brains that says, this infrotemporal cortex neuron has to respond to Simon and this one to whole thing just So we have to set it up yeah. just based on forward inputs and then trying to split things up into different categories based on the statistics. No, no, but what of I the mean input. is there's a teacher saying this is a dog, this is a snake, this is that, which is the same that this guy is doing with his Yeah, but you only do it once. So basically, uh, you know, a Google trained thing would have to have a million pictures of cats and you say cat, 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 a million pictures of dogs. With a, with a, a human child, you just see do dogs and cats running around and then one day you say that's a dog and that's a cat, end of story. So the labelling process is what you add at the end of the, you've already got your visual system is doing everything before you need the labelling. The labelling is, is, you know, useful, obviously. Yes for language. And let me say, I think that's absolutely crucial. So what you're doing is you form the categories in an unsupervised way that it's one person or another. And then once you've got the categories formed by self-organizing unsupervised learning, it's then a pretty easy job. It's just trivial, it's actually learn pretty somewhere trivial. somewhere else that yeah. you're just going to call this person Simon and this person mm -hmm. Rodrigo. Yeah. That's as simple as this. So actually, I thought it, it, related to this, you know, adding semant this, uh, this system, you put in an image, seven layers of boring you know, uh, neurons with no spikes or anything, no attention, etc. And it comes up with these thousand labels. And you, you could see that these are, these are grandmother cells, I think, in all, because the, the selectivity is so high, you, know, you saw it would respond massively to whatever it was, like, uh, and very little uh, to the other ones. So you know, it can be done. It can be done in, a, in, in something which has nothing particularly interesting. It's just convolutional neural networks. Anyway, adding semantics, you know, if you take this picture, and I don't know how good you are on your, you know, sort of Greek history, that's actually, you, but you could imagine that Google could train it up with all lots of pictures of, uh, and come out with the answer Plato, which is uh, who it is. And then, because you're Google, then you've got all the other stuff, which is a, a semantic network, which could all, you know, all of these other things could recognise the photographs of, uh, of uh, statues of Socrates and so on. And then you associate those together just by using uh, connections again. And you've got, now you've got a system which has massive amounts of memory. It's got the key to open the lock, if you like. The image comes in, 
it get, comes up with a label Plato, and, and you've already got all this facts of philosopher, and, and if it's got information about wh when he was alive and where he was born, you could get all that stuff, and it's basically, we're still only, we haven't moved off, you know, boring neurons, really. It's just, uh, this is just a semantic net network. Uh, and uh, it, it's related to the question of, you know, this sort of, a, if this bit of, uh, of the semantic network was decoupled from here, and you maybe not be able to get into it, but the memories could still be there. But this is using sort of grandmother-like semantic network coding, which, you know, some people don't like, uh, but actually, if you're Google, you might as well do it that way. It's just, it's just nodes in a semantic network. So, um, uh, so, in a sense, you could say the problem is solved. You know, if you're Google, you're happy. You know, you can sell this sort of stuff. Uh, because you've got a, a stupid feed-forward neural network, less than a million neurons, can actually beat humans. Uh, and all the information is in the synaptic weights. But as, and this is exactly what Edwin was saying, the way you train it is so unlike anything that could possibly happen in, in a real brain that we have to forget that bit. But the architecture itself is actually pretty pretty robust, and I think, you know, uh, we can use it as, as, a, as, a, as a reasonable model. Um, as I said, you know, the, the trick for, uh, the, the only thing that really changed between PDP and connectionist models in the 80s and what we got now is that we've got graphics boards that work uh, 10, uh, 11 teraflops, and we have mountains of labeled data which we didn't have back in those days, but thanks to Google and all the rest of it, you know, if you want, if you want a million pictures of the Eiffel Tower, just click on the, and you, you've got them. I mean, and, and it's all labelled by people nicely saying, I was at the Eiffel Tower, uh, and you've got that data. So, uh, so what I would like to suggest is that we want to move on to something better, and Edmund was already talking about unsupervised learning in Viznet. I've got a, my own particular... Um, uh, uh, slant, if you like, and it's using spike-based processing specifically. Uh, and in particular, the well, two things actually. One is using the wave of spikes as a uh, that, that generated by a flashed image, or in fact by any stimulus in the auditory system or tactile system. There's, there's huge amounts of information in the temporal ordering of spikes. This is not just simply correlations. It's not saying that these two fired together. It's saying who fired first. And it's actually a, a pretty good way of getting information even, uh, even without having to wait very long. So all of these neurons have fired one spike, but I can, you can actually tell the shape of this intensity profile by looking at you know, who fires first. Uh, so that's something that I want to try and convince you that that's useful. And the other thing is STDP, spike time dependent plasticity rules, which we'll get onto a bit later. This is the idea that the weights between neurons change every time the neuron fires, uh, and it depends on when the input's fired relative to the output neuron. And what I'll try and show you is that uh, uh, one of the features of STDP is that if you keep repeating the same pattern of spikes, neurons will automatically become tuned into the inputs that fire first. And that seems to be a pretty robust thing. And that's actually a very useful thing, because it means that you can, you can set up systems that can make very rapid decisions just simply by looking at who fires first. So, um, so we've already seen this sort of idea. Now the question is, you know, uh, is this... Uh, is this I've tried to sort of express the idea. This is not, it's not, it's not like in, in, in the Google things where every, every neuron in, every, in, in the layer three simultaneously calculates and, and generates its output level. It, it, it's very sort of graded. There are things are going through at different, uh, uh, different, uh, different speeds, if you like, depending on the neuron. And, and this, this is where coding with spikes, I, I think, becomes interesting. So actually, it's very interesting that if you go back to the very, very first uh, recordings from optic nerves uh, by Lord Adrian in Cambridge in 1929, this is actually a figure from, I think, the first, one of his very first papers. And it's, it's showing the, the uh, 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 population firing in an, an optic nerve. I can't remember which animal it is. In response to two stimuli, uh, a brighter stimulus and a, and, a, and a slightly dimmer stimulus. And what you can see, this is the 
frequency uh, firing spikes per second. And you can see uh, lots of interesting... The stimulus comes on here, it goes off there. You can see an off response, an on response. You can see that with the brighter stimulus, you've got a maintained firing rate of nearly 100 spikes per second population uh, relative to, I don't know, 40 here. Great firing rates, uh, fantastic. Uh, the, uh, the onset firing rate is, is higher here as well. But there's something else that is immediately obvious in this very first uh, recording from... Uh, and that's that the latency is completely different. Look at the latency here. It's, uh, I don't know, uh, nearly, what, 250 milliseconds here, and it's about 125 there. In other words, if you've got, if you've got two bits of the retina and you flash two images, two stimuli, one is dim and one is bright, you already know which was brightest, wh where the stimulus was brightest, because it fired earlier. Now, for some reason... That simple fact, which Lord Adrian had in his paper, has been ignored by much of the, well, uh, nearly all neurophysiologists and, and I would say all uh, theoretical neuroscientists who uh, assume that, you know, coding things at a fine rate gets everything you want. But there's information in the onset latencies which can be useful. And you know, one of the reasons why this got lost is because people like Hubel and Wiesel were waving bars around. You couldn't get the onset latency there. But then, then the other thing that happens is that when, when people... This is uh, Bob Wurtz and Mickey Goldberg. I think this is a superior colliculus. Well, you take the, the original spiking pattern. You, uh, this, is a, this is a raster display. But then the first thing you do is to convert that into a firing rate in the form of a post-stimulus time histogram. And what you're interested in is the peak firing rate. And a lot of people will you know, uh, say that you know, studying the peak firing rate as a function of stimuli is all we need to characterise the stimuli. But for me, uh, you know, it's missing some, a vital part. And um, I think you know, the classic view, you know, this is a cartoon, you've got spikes coming in here, and you could count them if you want here, but actually a modeler, what they really want is you know, the floating point numbers. You know, so we just, uh, so, and then the neuron, it, it generates spikes, but actually that's a floating point number too. So models are often, and, and, and in fact, you know, the, the deep learning things, they're all done with floating point numbers. That's, the graphics boards work well because they, they're super fast at you know, multiplying floating point numbers. In that view, the spikes themselves are actually irrelevant. It's just, you know, nature had to send spike uh, information that way, but, you know, if you, you could do it just as well with a floating point number. <laughs> the proof is that it does work. You know, Google, that's what they do. Um, but the temporal coding view is, is that the, the spike timings actually really do matter, and, and, and Edmund mentioned that, you know, Things like synchrony and so on, we have all the stuff that, you know, uh, uh, that uh, Wolf Singer and others uh, have been proposing. And, and you're, you're right that the, you know, the idea that you need synchrony uh, per se to be able to do the binding doesn't look very convincing. Oops, sorry. Uh, but my, oh dear. My personal view is actually that it's the ordering of the spikes which is critical. And, and for the simple reason, I'm sorry about this. But a, 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 any neuron is like a capacitor with a threshold. And if you stimulate it with a strong stimulus or a weak stimulus, it takes uh, uh, some time to get to the threshold. As you increase the, thresh, uh, the, the intensity, it gets to threshold earlier. I think everybody knows this, and it's uh, in the auditory system. It's obvious, you know, as you, when, the, when you move a stimulus around, it, uh, the, the volume changes, and it changes the latency of the, of the response. Um, uh, and, and so you can get information from the, the firing order, uh, and, uh, and that can be used to do processing very fast. We, you know, we've been looking at the temporal constraints. You want the system to work really fast. If you can use the ordering, then you can potentially do... Uh, uh, yes, oh, sorry, this is the thing done a bit more correctly. Okay. Now, in the optic nerve, for instance, you've got a million fibres coming out of the back of the eye, You've got the photoreceptors and the bipolar cells and, and, and these are the ganglion cells. And of course, as we know, biology got it wrong because the, the ganglion cells are at the front of the eye and the receptors at the back. But anyway, it still works. And what are these cells doing? Well, they're essentially doing things like lo local convolutions, uh, com comparing the luminance for the one pixel, one photoreceptor with its neighbours. And so, you know, one of these fibres, as you increase the local contrast, the latency... Uh, drops. It's you know well well established fact, and you've got on centre cells and off centre cells. 
such that, you know, if you imagine the, this is a very, very simple retina, you put in the stimulus, it's going to do something like this. You're going to get a firing here, uh, but even when each cell has only fired one spike, you can still get information. And here I'm actually just reconstructing a, a, a sort of mini retina uh, of, with 32 p pixels across. Uh, and this is a percentage of neurons that are fired, and you don't need that many to be able to say that this is Charlie Chaplin. Now, that's a very sim uh, small stimulus, but actually we, we've done the same thing with large images. This is with Ruf and Van Rulen. It was a toy retina uh, with just on and off center receptive fields at different spatial scales. But here what we're doing is we're reconstructing an image using only the first spikes from each neuron. And, and, and we're using the fact that the, 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 the neurons that fire first are where they get the best support. So, um, and this is the percentage of neurons in the retina that have fired. And, uh, and you can see that the image gets reconstructed progressively. But if I was to stop that here and say, is there an animal? Not only you can say it's an animal, but you can say it's a fox because we've just got the ears. If I, if I moved it back a little bit, you might, uh, you might have a bit more difficulty. But the, the point is that you don't need all the spikes. You just need the first few if you have a system which prioritizes the most, uh, most salient information. And that's what neurons do. So if you just flash an image on the retina, the first retinal ganglion cell to fire will do it at the point, in principle, where, where the contrast was highest. So um, we actually used that idea in a, uh, in a, in an, again, it's a toy problem, really, with Arno Delorme. This is a paper, a paper from his thesis where we're doing face identification with one spike per neuron. An image comes in, we've got on and off center receptive fields as in the, gang, in, in the retina, and then we feed those directly into a bunch of oriented filters, okay, so a little bit like the Gabor patches we saw earlier on. And then we go immediately into a recognition layer. So we, the, the, the visual system here is like, you know, absolutely as, uh, as short as it could possibly be, but it actually works. Here's an image coming in, and, and uh, this is uh, this, the Olivetti face of the data set that, that Edward was using. There are 40 people in the image set, and there are 10 views of each person. And this is the, uh, the we're coding the latency of firing in the on and off cells uh, uh, by the luminance. So it's, if it's white, it, it's very early. If it's gray, it's a bit later. This is the order of firing and the orientation maps. And w by simply fixing the set of weights to, for a particular, we show um, a particular phase once, and we fix the weights on the earliest firing neurons, pick a, and you can produce a little sort of receptive field here. And uh, we're using the same tricks that Edmund use, uses. That's to say, as soon as this neuron fires, it inhibits every other one. So you can only, you have to guess, essentially, which of the 40 people uh, is present. So each of these is trained with one image, okay, which is not very realistic, but they're actually remarkably good at picking up all of the phases. So here's, uh, in this paper, we, we um, uh, Arno, sorry, uh, let's just, this is a montage of all the Olivetti face database. There are 400 faces in it in one picture. Each face is only about 20, 28 by 24 pixels, so it's really quite, quite cool, coarse. But every green rectangle means that the first neuron to fire in the recognition layer had the right identity. So imagine it's a huge network, this, because it's, it's about 1,000 by 800 pixels. And for every pixel, we've got 40 different neurons, 40 different maps of neurons, uh, with one neuron looking for its favorite face. And it does very well, because there are, there, I think there are seven errors, where an error means that it got the wrong person. The, the first neuron to fire was not the correct one. It's incredibly resistant to luminance, uh, contrast changes, because when you get the contrast down to like 1.5%, you can't even see anything hardly. But if you imagine boosting the contrast, it is actually still recognizable who it is. And the reason why that works is it's simply because we're only using the first neurons to fire. We don't, we don't care about the rest. And that's why a moony face actually can work, because we're just picking off. These are sort of the equivalent of a moony face, right? 
And this is 50% of the pixels are random, and it still works. So when we discovered this, we set up a, a, a spike net uh, technology a company in 1999, which uh, actually was bought this summer by Brainchip Corporation, uh, the Californian uh, outfit. Um, but if you, if you like, that's a feed-forward convolutional neural net with two layers, OK? Uh, not seven, not a hundred, but they all work. And it's just a, a trade-off. This is the most unbelievably expensive way of doing invariant object recognition because you have one neuron for every pixel in the image looking for every object. Yes, you could do that. No, the brain doesn't do it because, you know, you, 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 you get two objects in V2 sort of thing and, uh, and then you'd run out of neurons. So the real brain does it progressively by doing what Edmund does in Visnet. You increase the receptive field sizes and, and so on. Uh, but it's still the same sort of basic principle. OK, uh, now I've got enough time, I think, to maybe say a little bit about the learning with spikes trick. OK, um, so, um, so we've talked about coding with spikes. And I gave you a learning rule, which you know, is actually very ad hoc. We just simply fix, here's an image. Tell me where the, the, you know, the first neurons to fire in the or orientation maps, and you fix those, and then you've got, that's how you learn something. So to give an example, if the first four neurons in, in, in visual cortex uh, were to fire with this, and you fix those four weights in a neuron in the next thing, and it said, if the first four neur neurons to fire are that, then it's a face, that pretty much captures a little bit what we're, what we're doing here. Uh, uh, and, it's, uh, and the learning rule is a one-shot learning rule, because you, you, you just have to sort of draw around a bit of the image you want to learn and say, learn that. That's not how we learn things either. Uh, but I think the uh, spike time learning, dependent learning um, rules uh, possibly are more realistic. So um, spike time dependent plasticity, sort of simple version, if this, if this neuron fires just after this input fires, then the you reinforce this synapse and maybe decrease the other ones. This is, we've already seen the sort of idea. So synapses that fire before the target neuron gets strengthened, those that fire afterwards can be depressed. We actually been using a simplified rule, which is, this is a, this is a fairly standard one used by modelers with a sort of exponential function. This, what this means is that if the neuron fires at time zero, any input that was active just before, you know, a millisecond before, will be very strongly potentiated. Those were active 45 milliseconds before, only a lot less. As soon as your, your input fire, uh, um, spike arrives after the spike, you say, no, I'm not interested in that, and you depress it. So that's basically, and lots of people have been studying that. In our rule, we actually uh, been using a simplified thing where actually all the inputs get depressed a bit except the ones that were active just before. And that's a, actually a way of normalizing weights that might be interesting for Heim, for instance. If you just say you've got 1,000 inputs, every time the neuron fires, 900, 950 of them are reduced by a tiny bit, and 50 of them are increased. You can just keep the weights constant. Now, uh, one of the natural consequences of this sort of rule is that if you have a repeating pattern, you get high synaptic weights concentrating on early firing inputs. And to illustrate the, the, the idea, here we've got a, a neuron with just 12 inputs. And let's assume that the, uh, those 12 inputs have got weights of 0.25 arbitrary units. And that the threshold of the neuron is 3. So it actually needs all 12 to fire to get it over threshold. And then we're going to uh, have a, a temporally structured pattern, which is going to repeat. Uh, uh, over and over again. So on the first trial, here comes the spikes. Uh, they all activate their synapses. You get the neuron over threshold. They all fired before, and so the STDP rule will reinforce them all, such that on the second presentation of the, exactly the same pattern, you don't need all 12. You, you maybe only need, let's say, nine. So nine get reinforced. Uh, three get, start to drop away. Third presentation, now maybe you only need six. Uh, uh, fourth presentation, maybe you only need three. And if you just do this you know, five or six times, we end up with a situation where we've potentiated three out, out of the 12 synapses. 
And it just so happens that the three that we potentiated are the, f the first three in the pattern. Now, you can imagine that uh, that's one neuron, but you could have other neurons uh, that have learned other combinations. They're actually essentially looking for coincidences. Now, uh, and you can have exactly like Edmund was talking, inhibitory connections between them, so they're not allowed to learn the same thing. And so here, for instance, we've got a pattern which you say, now, is this a good pattern for these four neurons? Well, it turns out that yes, because you know, these, uh, the, the, those red ones activate the first one, and the, the, those are the second, and those are the third one, and those are the fourth one. And so, yeah, that, that, that pattern will activate all, all four, four neurons. And they will do it even if you've got them embedded in noise. It's just looking for coincidence detection, actually. Um, and if you add in a, a neuron here that, that will only respond when all four of them fire, then this is actually going to be a very selective neuron. Note that the ordering of those red and blue and, uh, uh, doesn't matter. You can shuffle them. Now, you remember yesterday I was saying that when we, learn, when we train people on 500 milliseconds of noise and then chop it up in little bits and scramble it, it still works which is exactly what you can see here. The system, contrary to a view that I used to push back, you know, 20 years ago, the, the system was really sensitive to the ordering. It's more ordered, it's packets of spikes which have to uh, arrive uh, appropriately. And that's very much a toy demo. Uh, let me just uh, show that this actually really does scale up very nicely. So with Tim Maskelly and uh, Rudy uh, Guillenot, we, we did some simulations with um, actually not 100 afferents. They were actually in the simulations, there were 2,000 afferents coming into the system with totally random noise. It's, it's, these, are all, uh, these are all Poisson processes with underlying rates that are just wandering all over the place, no correlations whatsoever. This is just pure noise, except that we've randomly chosen uh, a subset of them uh, uh, and picked a random bit of activity and copied that, copy-pasted that activity uh, at random intervals. So the red spikes, we, do, we replace the spikes here with red spikes, and we do that uh, multiple times. But we don't, you know, there's no restriction on, you know, when we do this. Now, if I, if, if, uh, remember there are 2,000 of these as well, so this is a huge amount of stuff. And if I was to say, is there something that repeats, if I hadn't conveniently coloured them red, you'd have a pretty tough time, OK? It's actually quite a horrible problem. But the remarkable thing is that one neuron with, uh, uh, with STDP, an integrate and fire neuron, on its own will pick up that repeating pattern. Uh, no, no, nothing magic here. It's just straight uh, STDP. This is the activity of the neuron uh, right at the beginning. It's got, lots, it's got 2,000 synapses, which have all got very low weights. So it's actually getting a lot of input, because these, all these neurons are firing away like crazy. So the neurons firing at about 50 spikes per second to start with. The gray bits are where that repeat, those red spikes are. So initially, you can't see very much. But this is, this is just five seconds into the simulation. And that, those are the last random spikes. Now it's firing every time the pattern comes on. And if you leave it for a few minutes, this is, this is uh, what, five minutes later, it's actually backtracked to the very beginning of the, of the red spikes. Why? Because every time it fires a spike in the red spikes, it will reinforce red spikes which were just before. So the next time, it will tend to fire a little bit earlier. So it will find the beginning of any repeating pattern. One neuron on its own. If you've got multiple, yeah, sorry. So does it actually to the activity just before the red spikes, or does it respond to the red spikes? It, it's effect effectively the red spikes, because if you get back to the very... It's a, at this point here, it's, it's, it's about 10 milliseconds after the red spikes start. It needs you because know, the enough... the activity before that is random, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So it, it, it will stop going backwards there, because it will run out of things to work on. So it sort of it gets blocked there. And if you've got multiple neurons and they're inhibiting each other, you get an interesting thing, which is the first neuron sort of backtracks to here. It's inhibiting its neighbours, who would also like to get back to the beginning, but they're inhibited. So you, the next neuron will line up next here, and the next one here. And so you, you go from a 50 millisecond 
pattern of repeating random spikes, uh, the red spikes, into uh, the output layer, which has uh, a bunch of neurons which is exquisitely selective and fire a little sequence of pulses, bum, 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 every time the red things happen. So, uh, in fact, the reason why this happens is, is uh, there's no, there isn't any magic. This is, uh, this is the 2000 afferents, and uh, uh, the, the, weight, the weight values of the synapses are actually uh, coded by the grayscale level here. So the, there are actually a thousand red spike, red spike neurons and a thousand that are not. The, red, the ones that are not have just dropped away completely. The ones that in the red spike, the red spikes that actually matter, uh, this, is where, this is the 50 milliseconds, and it's just the ones that are actually active at the beginning. And this is it's just purely mechanical. Here's the resting potential of the cell during background noise. As soon as the red spike pattern starts, then the neuron sort of ramps up and goes over the threshold. It has to, because that's where its weights are. Uh, and interestingly, what will happen if we played the pattern back to front? It will fire at the end. And that, uh, but then it will start, if you kept doing that, it would go back to the beginning again. So the ordering is not actually critical in the sense that it doesn't care what the ordering is. You can play it back to front and it will still work, but it will just naturally go back and find the beginning. Now, that's rather a neat thing. In other words, when things happen in the environment repeatedly, your neurons, even one neuron on its own, if, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if this is the way it, it works, will naturally uh, find, not only become selective to that repeating pattern, but it will, it will backtrack to find the beginning. And that's, that's going to be very useful because, you know, those red spikes might mean, you know, it might be some noise or something which, uh, which may be significant. But there's no supervision here. Uh, so I, uh, uh, I've got some other illustrations of, of this, and I th but I think I'll leave that to tomorrow, maybe, and leave, uh, just uh, leave some question, time for questions here. But I've given you the, the sort of the essence of, of an unsupervised learning rule which only cares about spike timing which uh, will learn any arbitrary patterns. Uh, it's nothing to do with spikeness, firing rates of the individual neurons. The red spike neurons can be very quiet or not. It's the synchrony, if you like, which, which really gets picked up. So, I'll, I'll, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll save some stuff, because I've got a bit of some time for tomorrow. But, yeah, let's, let's take some questions. On yeah, that. well, it's not really, like, directly a question, but it's just... So, it's also been shown that, basically, if you have synapses firing after the target. So generally you have you would have like a depression in the But like it's been shown that if you have neuromodulators uh, into the equation that basically then it can cause LTP as well. So like I think it's just another way of like changing this pattern and also Okay, like so there's a di slight difference between the sort of patterns I'm talking about and L LTP because the, uh, you've got the 2,000 afferents here, and it's just random noise, and we're just, we've just taken some bit of it, and we're repeating it. <coughs> LTP would be the equivalent of taking those 2,000 afferents and going wham, activating all of them synchronously, and, uh, and that really that produces a very strong signal for learning, and yes, all the side apses will be potentiated. So if you were to look at this, you know, if you were to instead of uh, having my nice uh, randomly chosen red spikes, you just said, I'm going to stimulate the entire you know, uh, perforant path or whatever. All the, neuron, all the afferents fire synchronously. All the neurons will fire a spike. They will all learn all the synapses, and it will go like this, bang. Uh, now that's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a way of studying the system, but it's not actually uh, realistic, because no, we no, do... I just meant, like, generally, yeah. so, like, you said, like, the synapse get, gets activated if you like basically have the, uh, the like pre synapse firing before the like the pre post synapse. Yeah. But I was just saying that like there is something that's added to the equation if you have neuromodulators. Okay, so I haven't, I haven't put any neuromodulation in here, yeah. but it would be perfectly okay to say. You know, I want to, to be able to control the speed with which the, these, these weight changes occur, maybe, uh, you know, because I'm more attentive, I want to learn now. So that's fine. But what I'm saying is that the, the basic learning rule doesn't require to have somebody to come in and say, learn now. That could be an advantage, but it's not necessary. And if you, if you backtrack to yesterday when I was giving you the illustration of 
meaningless noise coming in. Subjects are sitting listening to eight minutes of shh, trying to detect when the amplitude drops. And even when they're doing that, and they're not trying to do anything, the, uh, you get that 200 millisecond little snippet that repeats five times, and you get a big ERP. Why would anybody uh, worry about you know, neuromodulation there? The subjects are not trying to learn anything. So I think, uh, I think it's worth considering that there is an inbuilt property of all neurons with or without attention, with or without signals to say this is a reinforcer that will uh, allow them to learn to become selective to stimuli that repeat. And, and you can add in the, the, you know, the extra, uh, extra boost, for instance, if you're in a very, you know, if there's something dangerous has happened and your noradrenaline kicks in and, and so on. But I think, I think neurons have to be equipped with the ability to learn these patterns, uh, even in the absence of a, of a supervisor to tell you this is important. I guess on that. Yeah. So, so maybe, um, so the idea that human learning is unsupervised, maybe we can clarify a bit on this, because, I mean, you see on different levels, I think, for example, of semantic categorization that culturally there are like, a lot of differences. So some cultures don't even have the category of animals, for example. Um, you oh, can really? see it on, yeah. <laughs> you can they see don't have a word for it, or they don't? Uh... Well, I, I, read, I saw it actually, I think, in a tech talk. Um, so some people, 100 years ago, in certain areas, they wouldn't, they would have completely, like, Different. Okay. Because you know, you know, the, the easiest thing to decode from interferential, you know, so temporal lobe cortex in humans, you know, uh, people like uh, Nikos van uh, uh, Krieger's quarter, and uh, it, it basically it's animate versus non-animate. It's it, it, it just drops out. It's uh, it's very very fundamental. So any, yeah, but anyway, maybe um, also like on the perceptual level. So if you look at um, phonetics. So you have the same sounds, um, and depending on which language you will grow up with, you will categorize the same sounds into two different sounds or not, and you will even perceive them. So okay. if you have a lot of um, information from your environment which shapes your perception. Um, and also, I mean, you, you're born with some kind of information already, right? So the, your network is not agnostic to the world. So I, from what I know, you're already born with the ability to distinguish different colors and um, basic visual features. Well, you, you're born with, with uh, photoreceptors with uh, cone, cone pigments and yeah. that's, that's hardwired by genetics, yes, yes for sure. Um, so. But the, the way you wire them up is maybe less hardwired. Yes, yeah, so just the point is I think that you're, you're given a lot of information either by, by your genes or by the environment about how to categorize um, Okay, uh, we'll, I'll come back and deal with that one again tomorrow because I'm going to give you some illustrations of how this sort of thing can be applied to, you know, learning uh, about faces, learning about cars, and things like this. So it, it's uh, it is very much instruction-based thing. So basically, basically, if you live in, a, in an environment where there are no cars, you won't learn about cars. You know, so it's very very much. Uh, environment dependent, uh, what, what, what gets uh, generated uh, will depend on you know, what language you're exposed to and things like this. There may be some you know, innate biases to doing some things. I mean, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I think is m most likely is fear responses to spiders and snakes. And there's a theory that this is actually done by the pulvinar directly the retinopulvinar connections. I mean, uh, it seems pretty amazing, but um, they have really short latency responses to snakes in the primate pulvinar, and nobody really knows how it happens. So there may be a couple of things, but I think 99.9% you know, .9 of everything that we recognize, we've learned to recognize it, in my opinion. Yeah. Can I just comment on that? Because <coughs> I think that's a really sort of incredibly important point. So it's unsupervised, and there's no one telling the neurons at the end what to respond to. But of course, the environment is different. So Eskimos have apparently 20 categories of snowflakes. So their environment is different, they have different stimuli. So with unsupervised learning, they will produce different categories. Okay? So it's not so much that it's supervision from the top down, that's the point. It's what's built given the statistics of the environment. It was one of the questions, actually, the labeling process is clearly critical. 
But there's a huge difference between saying, I need the labels to learn, and I learn the stuff, and then I label it afterwards. And, and I think those, th th those are two very different ways of seeing how our brains work. Well, well it, you know, in the end, it is when you say, you know, what colour is this, and you have to use red or green or no, whatever. Yeah, you don't need a label to distinguish between two different sounds. No. I mean, absolutely. You yeah, as, as, as demonstrated, I think, by the auditory noise learning thing. I mean, you know, we all picked up the thing, uh, but we don't have any you know, verbal labels for this, so that's precisely the problem. And yet your auditory system has picked up the repeating structure, and it happens within seconds. It's half past 12. I think we should all have a break and uh, get ready to go sledging for those who want to do it.